We've got everybody here that we're waiting for, so we'll go ahead and um, I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, Karen, if you can call the roll. Yes, President Furman. Present. Vice President Curry. Here. Alder Bennett. Presente. Alder Conklin. Here. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Heck. Here. And Alder Abbas. You have quorum. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, does anybody know if we have any registered, uh, any people registered for comment? We do not. Then we uh, do not have to do the whole tech intro. Um, we can skip that. Um, okay, so uh, the first order would, would have been public comment. There, there's nobody registered. Um, is there any disclosures and recusals by any members of the body? Uh, seeing none, um, we'll move right into our interview process. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, this evening, we will be interviewing six candidates uh, for the District 11 vacancy. Um, tonight's format will be two rounds. Um, round one will include three questions, and candidates will be given five minutes total to answer those three questions. At the end of those, at the end of round one, um, CCEC members will be um, ranking their, their choices um, from one to six, and the top three candidates uh, will go on to the next round. Um, round two will have five questions, and candidates will have five minutes um, to answer each, five minutes each question to answer. They're not, they're not hard stops, but we're really hoping that people um, you know, speak no more than five minutes. If you go a few, few moments over, that's fine. We're not gonna cut your mic off, um, but we're hoping people can stay within that. Um, I, all candidates were provided um, a copy of the questions uh, this weekend. Um, so hopefully they've had an opportunity to think about these questions. There, not, there will, will be no surprises this evening. Um, CCEC members and council members can ask clarifying questions at the end of um, each interview in round one. Um, and those are intended not to be new questions, but if there was something said that uh, somebody's looking for clarification, uh, there'll be an opportunity then. And we'll do the same thing again in round two. Um, I do want to note, um, I have been through this process. I know it's um, a nerve, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy process, but I appreciate you all um, I'm willing to come out this evening and, uh, and volunteer to do this position. So um, there, is, there is no right answer to these questions. We're, we're looking to learn more about you. We'll certainly be taking into consideration um, your applications. Um, and uh, you know, uh, hope to hope to have some good discussions tonight. So, um, with with that, um, is there any questions by any CCEC members or any of the candidates at this point? All right, not seeing any. We'll jump right into it. Um, so, uh, we're going to go um, in in alphabetical order um, as listed in our agenda. Um, and so, our first applicant is Peter. Um, Peter. Uh, the, the three questions that we have for you um, are, uh, describe your involvement in civic activities. What do you know about the position and why did you decide to apply for the position? Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for taking the time to meet with us this evening. So I moved to Madison in 1983 and uh, I, moved to Hill, I moved to District 11 in 1990 and to Hill Farms in 1994. From 1989 to 2001, I worked at the Attorney General's office here in uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin Attorney General's office. And I dealt with what would be called uh, complex and high profile litigation often. Uh, but most of that did not involve municipalities. But one big exception to that was we had a case where we worked closely with the city of Milwaukee, their city attorney's office and the police department to try to put a halt to uh, blockades that were occurring at abortion clinics in Milwaukee. We had a district attorney who back then uh, was reluctant to bring charges, I think for religious reasons against people who were blockading. Uh, so that was my work experience in that decade. Uh, in the mid nineties, I was the representative of the Van Heys uh, Elementary School attendance area on a, on a committee established by the Madison School District to address issues of school boundaries and uh, diversity. In uh, the late 90s, my wife and I were uh, licensed as foster parents for a couple of years. Uh, from 1998 to 2000, I was the 
uh, president of the Van Huys PTO. In the early 2000s, but this was just a single incident, uh, I worked, I was, uh, I was uh, part of a principal selection process for the Madison School District. From some point in the 2000s, I don't know the exact year, until 2009, I was on the Madison Board of Review, and I was ultimately became the chair of that board. Uh, in in uh, 2006, I served as a poll watcher for the Democratic Party. In uh, the 2008 primary election, I served as a poll watcher for the Obama campaign. And in the general election, that year, I served as a poll watcher supervisor. Uh, one other thing I'd mention, uh, since I think Nick's on the on this call, is uh, for a number of years I also played the accordion in the Hill Farms marching Fourth of July marching band. From two thousand nine in two thousand nine, I was appointed to the circuit court by Governor Doyle. And I served there until uh, 2020. And again, that was my job. It wasn't. It wasn't really public. It was public service, but it wasn't uh, volunteer public service. But there were three things about it I'd mention in particular. One is judges regularly see people with mental health issues. Uh, sometimes it's very explicit because there's a commitment at hand. But often it's just it's simply the underlying some underlying aspect of the case or the person. In addition. We also saw people with what I would call housing insecurity, although to be honest, at, in a lot of ways, courts cause it because they evict people. And that's probably the, that's the place we would see it. Plus we would see people in foreclosures. Uh, we at least tried to be compassionate, uh, but we often were uh, foreclosed from doing anything too uh, remedial in that regard. Finally, uh, I do, would mention that for a little over a year, I, I, I ran a veterans court in Dane County. And these were for veterans who principally had substance abuse, but sometimes just general mental health issues combined with some criminal justice issues. Again, I retired a couple of years ago, not quite two years ago. I've done some pro bono work since then. I did speak with the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 2001 regarding uh, redistricting rules. And uh, the only thing I'd say finally, as a, as a 39 year resident of this town is I have about I live on a quarter lot and I have about 200 linear feet of sidewalk, maybe a little more. And I want to say that sidewalk, it's kept clear, uh, winter and summer. You could eat your dinner off of it. I wouldn't do that, but anyway, it's pretty clear. As to what I know about this institute, about this body, you know, to be frank, I don't know a lot of the detailed work you've done. You know, I pick up on what's reported generally in the media. I have not followed any, I can't think of any particular legislation that you were dealing with or ordinance you were dealing with uh, that I followed closely. I certainly have never, I've never contacted an alder person for any reason uh, until I spoke with Arvina yesterday. And uh, so I've, I've been somewhat removed from the process. So that's just, that's my, that's just the truth. I did speak with Tim Kiefer, who's on the county board, and then Arvina yesterday, they were extremely helpful. Uh, uh, I would say Arvina was tremendously gracious and uh, offers to assist anybody that gets this position uh, in helping them understand what's needed and maybe get guiding them through. I also decided I should watch the uh, the transportation P committee. Peter, Peter, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Okay, that's fine. That, that's that's my background. The only thing, finally, is why did I apply? I should be doing public service. I've got the background. I've got the ability. I've uh, uh, I, I, rep I sufficiently represent this district, and I have the time because I'm retired. And that, thank you. And I apologize for going over. No, no problem. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, any clarifying questions from CCEC members uh, for Peter? Uh, Alder Heck, go ahead. Thank you, um, Peter. You mentioned service on the board of review um, because alders in, uh, that are currently on CCEC are. Uh, all were elected or appointed uh, in 2018 or later, the Board of Review no longer exists. In just a sentence or two, can you describe what the Board of Review does or did? I just want to say, I doubt that it no longer exists uh, because I have a neighbor who says he's on it and he goes, rides his bicycle down to it. But what they do, regardless of whether they exist or not, maybe they have a different name. Maybe they, they have, have a different name. Yeah. 
Um, so they review, uh, they review appeals of property tax assessments typically is what they do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you Alder Heck, for that clarifying question. And thank you, Peter. Any other clarifying questions? All right. Um, our next applicant is Jesse. Jesse, uh, same questions to you as well. Uh, describe your involvement in civic activities. What do you know about the position and why did you decide to apply for the position? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, and I also wanted to say, uh, Peter, Steve, Gary, Nick, I didn't see William on here, but uh, huge thank you and kudos just for um, putting yourself in this position to apply for at least the interim position. So um, I really admire that. I would I'll be honest, I was a little uh, hesitant if there would be less than a handful of applicants <laughs> running for this district. So uh, big kudos to all of you and thank you for taking the time. Uh, my wife and I moved here in 2015 and um, all the activities I'm gonna go through with uh, respect to civic duties or activities are all active right now. So um, I have worked for UW System Administration since 2012. Um, it's been great serving uh, the public sector there and I'm a huge advocate for higher education. I've been really, really involved with our neighborhood uh, since about 2017. I've been on the board for the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association, where I now serve as the president for the past few months. Uh, currently, my wife and I, we still volunteer for two marriage prep programs through the Madison Diocese. We also uh, volunteer uh, for a marriage prep program through uh, Our Lady Queen of Peace. I volunteer uh, soccer coaching right now <laughs> for the MSCR program. Uh, and then I also volunteer some time on our academic staff committee to review policies, bylaws, address current topics, issues uh, within my current employer. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to kind of lay this out because with this position, I really want to, you know, really push, push the envelope a little bit more in terms of exploring civic duties, um, because at this point, it's been a little bit more surface level. So what do I know about this position? Well, first of all, I've worked with Arvina to push through some initiatives with our Westmoreland uh, Park and, and shelter, um, kind of laying out the foundation there. And that was really what had gotten me interested in this role. Um, you know, I saw the I saw the position description. Obviously, you don't need a recap of that, but if I were to sum it up and in, in, in kind of my understanding of this role and how I think about it, it's it's essentially the service and, and you are the advocate uh, for your district and constituents. And um, I, I would say out of all the different things that I read through on the position description, um, you know, the one thing that I always come back to, and, and it's my background in communication for undergrad, grad school, is the communication with constituents, whether you use your listserv, newsletter, website, whatever whatever the channel is that you find more or less effective. Um, I think that is one of the uh, most important pieces of this role is having that communication channel open and have it two way. Um, so finally, uh, why did I apply? I already mentioned my time with Arvina. That's when it had got me uh, thinking a little bit more about getting more involved besides at more of a uh, very specific level within my my neighborhood, Westmoreland. Um, for my work, I, I lead uh, small and large scale changes. And and it's just one of those things that it overlaps with, with this type of position. So we take any kind of scale project within UW system and we engage with our stakeholders, our stakeholders here for the city, our constituents, District 11 for this position. But for my job, this is what we do. We engage with folks. We talk to them about design issues, design elements, and test through things. And while it's a little bit different from software, of course, it is the same process of human nature trying to collect feedback, get a better understanding of what works and what doesn't, and implement that change. So. Um, I decided to apply for this position because it it's the work I do in a very different environment, but it's essentially adopting change. It's passing, uh, you know, legislation or any types of um, things that are coming through, and and working with our constituents to make sure that that they're on board and and ready and able to adapt to those changes. So I guess just to sum up, I I really enjoy the process of engagement with 
with stakeholders. And I know it's our constituents. I mean, for my work, I call them stakeholders. Um, but I enjoy that process to get work accomplished. Um, chosen to be the alder for District 11, I'll gladly accept and to respond to any given challenges and issues this community needs. Um, and I also plan on running for alder in the 2023 election. So thank you for your time. And uh, thanks to all who are applying to this position. I think that means a lot. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Any uh, clarifying questions? <clears throat> okay, not seeing any. Um, and so we will, uh, thank you, Jesse. We'll move on to our next uh, candidate, uh, Steve Holtzman. Hi, Steve, uh, same questions for you. Describe your involvement in civil activities. What do you know about this position? And why did you decide to apply for this position? Steve, you're, you're muted, muted, Steve, you're muted. <laughs> you know, I see people doing that all the time on news shows and thought I would be, you know, evolved beyond that. Uh, so, well, thank you all. Uh, I'm sure that everybody was looking for one more meeting to go to. Um, I was on the city council from 95 to 05. Uh, it was so long ago that in my first term, I was started the technology committee with another alder from the 12th and we got the first computers and when i left we were just starting with legistar so it's amazing the way the technology has evolved i'm really a big fan of legistar and uh, but back to what i've been doing since i was off the council uh eight terms ago um I, initially i was a caregiver for my parents my dad had alzheimer's um he had it was blessed with great parents, but by 2016, they were both gone. So I became more of a volunteer. I had been doing some volunteer stuff before that, but uh, I'd been doing uh, elections for 22 years. I was a uh, poll worker and volunteered for about, or was about 75 elections. One of the things I did uh, when I was on the council, noting that there was a huge problem recruiting uh, poll workers is I uh, tied the compensation for poll workers to living wage. And ever since that problem has disappeared and it's been a lot easier for the clerk, the clerk to find people to staff uh, elections. Uh, I've also been a driver for the retired senior volunteer program uh, for uh, senior citizens and getting them to doctor's appointments and also veterans. Uh, but I've also been on the board of several organizations, mainly tied in with historic preservation. Uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, tours. Um, uh, we restored a ice boat that was a particularly valuable piece for telling a very special story about Madison in the 60s and 70s and what makes Madison special. And uh, we created a movie about that and I've been very successful with raising funds to bring that back. Uh, probably one of the greatest satisfactions comes from the Tappet uh, TNW Ensemble Theater used to be Tap at New Works. Uh, this is, I think, in our 33rd year. And uh, besides presenting plays, has a lot of programs that reach out for children, uh, especially in the summer. Uh, the um, main volunteer position I'm in now is with the Madison School Community Rec Program that uh, gives accessibility to people differently advantaged that ordinarily don't get to enjoy the lakes. And uh, people from community centers, uh, assisted living centers, we have wheelchair boarding. And uh, so all of that keeps me pretty busy. Um, I also audit classes in case you saw the CAP Times last week. And one of the things I learned being in um, uh, classes is that sometimes foreign students are working almost double time. They have to, uh, record the lecture in addition to being in that they translate it when they get home. And it may be sensitive to uh, some of the foreign students. So when I learned of a woman who was in quite a bit of trouble with her liquor license in her restaurant in State Street, uh, she was a brilliant businessman, had a uh, import export business in China, came here, started a restaurant, but um, uh, it was particularly satisfying helping her find her way through the process of getting a food cart license, a liquor license, uh, restored back to good standing. And um, it was really my uh, first 
re-engagement with the count uh, with city uh, government since leaving the position in 05. <clears throat> I was particularly impressed with how open Alder Revere was as an ALRC member. And uh, we started in the same class. He's done eight more terms than I have, but he was very welcoming and uh, uh, letting this woman, you know, come back into good standing. Uh, some of the things that, you know, really inspired me in addition to Revere, um, I didn't intend to, I didn't know that uh, Alder Bennett would be here, but uh, uh, there was a, at the end of April, a meeting about a project on Lake Mendota Drive. And it's really the only council meeting I've been a part of in all these years. And I was particularly impressed with something that Alder Bennett said in that meeting. And uh, it was seven hours into the meeting. I know because I went back to listen to this again. And uh, this was a group of people that uh, were trying to delay a project at any cost, anything they could do, anything they could throw up. Um, uh, Arvina was particularly skillful in recognizing that they had some insincere uh, connections with Ho-Chunk history that uh, they'd never expressed an interest in before. But um, it was Alder Bennett, who um, probably somewhere between a half and a third my age, uh, could, called out. The Steve, this is, a, this is a topic near and dear to my heart, but I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Okay. Um, you can okay. finish your thought, but 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 you're a little bit well, over. Well, well, you know. know, I have something more important to say. I didn't realize that's a fast five minutes, Keith. Um, one thing this district has lacked is candidates. I'm really thrilled that uh, Jesse is going to be running, but we typically reelect uh, alders unopposed. And uh, I look at myself as a bridge to the next election. I'd like to see about recruiting some candidates and have uh, there be uh, maybe a more diverse. Um, uh, example, uh, slate of candidates. One last thing I've noticed from the next door application that people do not understand restorative justice. This is a topic that I think is very important to bridge the racial gap and restorative justice is something that uh, people don't understand. And I think that would be something that uh, we need to be more proactive on. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Is there any clarifying questions for Steve? Okay, not not seeing any. I thought it was five minutes on each of those questions, so I, I had uh, way too many notes. <laughs> uh, understood. Um, our uh, so it's not seeing any clarifying questions. We're going to go on to our next candidate, which is Gary. Uh, Gary, uh, welcome. Um, same. Uh, three questions uh, for you that everybody else has had. Um, it's five total minutes. Um, describe your involvement in civic activities. Uh, what do you know about this position? Why did you decide to apply for this position? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've actually had a lot of civic involvement. It goes back to I was a Cub Scout leader as a Cub Master. I was a church officer. I was a trustee. I was on the Dane County Regional Planning Commission for five years. I've been an active in downtown Madison for over 20 years on multiple committees, including economic development, transportation, a bicycle and the platinum bike routes. During the recession, uh, DMI organized downtown design professionals and we worked on some ideas that we worked with the city planning department department to get some of them into the downtown plan. I was a member of the zoning rewrite committee. I participated in the TIF policy rewrite. I'm on the Hill Farms Neighborhood Planning Committee for about 10 years. Member of the Hill Farms Neighborhood Architectural Review Committee for about the same length of time. I'm chairman of a cemetery association in Pierce County. If you want to know more about that, we could to get into that. Uh, I'm a member of Downtown Rotary uh, for 30 years where I served as chairman of two committees and I was a member of the equity committee. Uh, I was also a board member in Rotary for two years. I've advocated to the city council, the plan commission. I uh, prepared a memo on 
TIF Joint Review Board restrictions and presented them and had the city attorney approve them. Uh, I was active in the Judge Doyle Square uh, bike station, high speed uh, train station location, the community market, um, Bike Federation of Wisconsin board member, president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American Planning Association for nine years, and I'm a poll worker. What do I know about the position? I really know, I think, quite a bit. For over 40 years, I served city councils and interested in, uh, in interactive with alders all over Wisconsin in my planning business. Um, I've attended many Madison council meetings, interacted with alders Gruber, Schmitz, Martin, Bevere, Bennett. I know Madison uh, uh, can have long meetings. I was at one at five in the morning. I know about how municipal government works, including municipal law. I had to use a lot of municipal law in, in, my, uh, in my business. Why do I decide to apply? Well, that's easy. I want to give back to my hometown. I was born and raised in Madison. I can use my years of experience to be part, just part, just part of helping our city succeed even further than it has. We still even have a more up up opportunity. I uh, would like to help facilitate, formulate policies that are non-discriminatory. There are some now that. I believe are, uh, and I've lived in this neighborhood for over uh, 30 years and been on those committees. So that's, that's why I'm interested. And I finished in less than five minutes. Thank you, Gary. Any clarifying questions for Gary? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, we will move on to our next candidate, which is Nick. Nick, welcome. Um, for now, looks like Alder Conklin. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Alder Conklin, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Exactly. Oh, uh, I couldn't get my hand up fast enough. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, Peter, I, I saw in your application, you said that you were the oh. president of, can you hear me? Um, yeah, uh, Alder Conklin, we're doing clarifying questions for, for Gary. Okay, but I think this is kind of partly because he was talking about his position. So I was just wondering what the Gary Peterson consultant was um, when he was talking about his positions and things of different things he said. But if not, we can skip that. No, that, that that's fine. So if you if you want, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll let it go, go if you want to, uh, you know, if, if he wants to spend uh, just a brief moment on on uh, explaining what what his consulting company is. I think that's what you're looking for, Alder Con Conklin. Is that correct? That is correct, thank you. Okay. okay. When I uh, graduated from the university, I worked for a national planning firm for eight years. And then I started my own firm and uh, it was Mid-America Planning Services. And we worked all over the state of Wisconsin uh, and Northern Illinois, uh, doing comprehensive plans, TIF districts, uh, zoning ordinances, subdivision regulations, uh, basically all the kinds of things that the city of Madison does in the way of where they work with the planning. I did a lot in housing, a lot of housing rehabilit rehabilitation. I'll talk about that later. Okay, thank you so much, Gary. Sure. Uh, thank you, Alder Conklin. Thank you, Gary. Um, uh, are there any other clarifying questions? Okay, not seeing any, uh, we'll move on to our next candidate, Nick. Uh, Nick, same questions for you. You have five total minutes. Uh, describe your involvement in civic activities. Uh, what do you know about this position and why did you decide to apply for this position? Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you to all of you for attending yet another extra meeting to take care of the necessary actions to fill Alder Martin's uh, vacancy. I would say I've been moderately involved in civic activities since I moved to M Madison 40 years ago. At the city level, I served on the Madison Arts Commission from 2006 to 2013, 
And in 2019, I incorporated and was instrumental in establishing the nonprofit Friends of the Madison Arts Commission. I served briefly on the Madison Sister City Coordinating Committee, uh, and I helped start Make Music Madison by serving on its governing board for its first two years. At the neighborhood level, I served for 20 years on the board of directors of the Hill Farms Neighborhood Association. And for most of that time, I coordinated the annual 4th of July neighborhood celebration. During that time, I also initiated what has now become the annual neighborhood Halloween parade and pizza party. Uh, I am currently a member of the Hill Farms Planning Committee, which developed the neighborhood plan in 2016, and among other things, reviews all proposals for development in the neighborhood. Just to be clear, I was not one of the major figures in developing the neighborhood plan, but I attended the meetings and contributed a little, and now I'm just a member of the committee. Although perhaps not strictly a civic activity, I will mention what I call my neighborhood science exhibits. Starting in 2007, I installed temporary educational signposts along the sidewalk in Rennebaum Park, illustrating various scientific concepts. And I invited the teachers in nearby Van Heys Elementary and Velma Hamilton Middle School to use them for their classes. The topics were the solar system, which has now made, been made permanent along the Southwest bike path. Um, a geological timeline and, and five others. I just received permission from the City Parks Commission to install the geological timeline in Ulbrich Park this summer. I've been involved in other activities at a community wide level, including music on uh, nonprofit boards and on the stage, theater on boards and on the stage, and as a writer of plays, including the Madison Sesquicentennial play and church. But those are normal for anyone. And I'll just mention two activities related to schools. First, my wife and I volunteered through the Schools of Hope program as reading tutors at Glendale Elementary. And second, since uh, school boards around the state have recently been under assault over the past few months, I have attended occasional school board meetings in both Madison and Middleton, telling the chair that I was there merely to serve as a moderating voice if necessary. And luckily, I haven't had to. Uh, about the position, I know that the Common Council is the city's legislative body. The members introduce ordinances and resolutions. I don't actually know if other entities such as the mayor or city staff can introduce proposed legislation. The Common Council holds public hearings on its proposal, debates them, modifies them, and possibly passes them. I now have a long list of other activities for which I thank Alder um, Foster in one of his online posts. He, he gave this long list, which adds up to about 46 hours a week of activities. So I'm familiar with the fact that Common Council meets twice a month with meetings occasionally lasting up to eight hours. Each alder serves on committees, commissions, and boards, which meet one or two times a month, usually half a dozen or so of those in total. And I sort of assume I would fill Alder Martin's position on her committee assignments if I were appointed. I have that list. I don't need to recite it. Um, alders should attend neighborhood meetings. District 11 includes nine different neighborhood or eight different neighborhood associations and the co-op housing association. Again, I have that list. You don't need me to recite it. Alders should meet when the occasion arises with city staff, colleagues, advocates, community and business leaders, and district residents. Alders write and post blog entries. Alders receive and respond to emails, uh, as many as 200 to 800 per week, as well as requests from the media. Alders attend special events in the neighborhood and the city. In addition to the information provided on Legistar, Alders should read and research the issues. As I said, Alder Foster's estimate is that this takes up to 46 hours a week. Uh, I'm applying for this position because I strongly believe that citizens should contribute to their community by participating in its activities, by attending at least some of its civic meetings when possible, and when appropriate, serving as members on boards, et cetera. I have volunteered and contributed at the neighborhood level. I've served on one city commission. I've thought about running for a position such as Alder, but I've never done it because at least here in Madison, there are many other well-qualified people, some of whom are on this call. And I frankly don't like the process of running for office. I tried it a couple of times. Second, 
I would not apply for this position if I didn't consider myself to be reasonably well qualified. I listed some of those qualifications in the answer to the first question. I won't repeat those. I'll just add a couple more. Um, one of them is a habit of working collegially. Nick, as well I'm definitely as in, uh, uh, just going to let you know you're a little over, so hopefully you can wrap up. Okay. Um, as a practical matter, I am retired. Uh, I have a lot of groups and meetings in the evenings, but I can let those go for a year, uh, leaving just one major weekday active afternoon commitment of caring for two granddaughters. And I should mention that uh, although I would be greatly um, satisfied from serving my community as an alder for up to 11 months, I have no further ambition and I would not run again in 2023. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Nick. Any clarifying questions for Nick? Okay, uh, not seeing any. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, we are gonna go to our next candidate, uh, William. Um, hi, William, welcome. Oh, yeah, thank you. Find you. Yeah, I go by Bill most uh, among friends. So um, yeah, uh, well, thank you for, for so not, giving me up. Now I'm a little bit confused. Should I call you William or Bill? I'm, I'm gonna call you Bill um, and I'm gonna give Please you the do. three questions. Uh, describe you. your involvement in civic activities. What do you know about this position and why did you decide to apply for this position? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've been a public uh, a public employee for 30 years working at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, Division of Continuing Studies. In fact, we're, we're the division uh, that supports the senior uh, uh, senior guest auditors. So uh, it's what, thank you for the shout out there. Um, uh, through my work, I've been, you know, actively involved with out outreach activities, bringing resources of the campus to the community. This includes a lot of television programs on Wisconsin Public Television, um, out outreach uh, resources and online resources uh, and topics such as social work, landscape architecture, history, and, and many more. Um, most recently, I've been very involved with the Odyssey program, uh, especially in their new location out in the uh, Villager Mall. Um, and uh, the Odyssey program is, is uh, a, a program that, that uh, provides college courses to, uh, to low-income adults to help break the, the generational uh, cycle of, po of poverty by providing them access to education. Um, most recently, because of my, my background in, in, in media and technology, I've been working closely with them to uh, bring uh, college courses and eventually degree programs to people, uh, uh, students who are behind bars. and. Uh, um, in addition to my, my work uh, uh, on campus, um, I also uh, am very active in, um, in my church. I serve on the Christian Education Board and also on its executive committee. Um, I've been a member of, of uh, the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association for, for a long time. Um, I've been living in this, in this neighborhood for almost 50 years now. Um, I have three very active kids who are involved in sports. And so I'm often attending a lot of, uh, of you know, basketball uh, games, uh, soccer, uh, a lot of Midvale Heights baseball games. I, I'm not a very good athlete, so I never really had a chance to, uh, to uh, serve as, as coach, but I do help out when I can. And I also volunteer at Wisconsin Public Television and I'm a standing member of Wisconsin Public Radio. Um, you know, I, I'm actually learning quite a bit more from this, this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, the Zoom call about uh, the roles of the altar, but the one thing I, I you know, I, I, you know, did know going into this position, in, into the, you know, looking at putting my name in here is that I would be needing to be a good listener, good advocate for District 11, and need to communicate um, the needs and views of the constituents with, and work with city, city staff, uh, serve on, on committees, and I. People I did talk to uh, told me that get ready for a lot of late nights, and uh, I'm prepared to brew a lot of, lot of, lot of tea to stay up, stay up late at night. Um, real quick, why did I apply for this position? I think it's kind of a sense of guilt. I uh, a number of years ago, I, I shared an office on campus with the uh, former lieutenant governor Barbara Lawton, and uh, she asked me back then, knowing my my family history and politics. Why I wouldn't? Why? Why I not run for office? Um, I told her, "Give me ten years." I have a I had a newborn at the time, um, and uh, you know I think I should say that my uh, my youngest son just turned uh, eleven yesterday. I really have no reason not to uh, to run now. Um, I've been interacting with with I've been kept in touch with Barbara over the years. 
Uh, I've been very involved with uh, helping a former student uh, at DW uh, who's running for uh, US Senate, Steve Alacara against Ron Johnson. And I was out uh, collecting signatures uh, for Steve. And, um, and when, when the announcement came out and I said, this is an opportunity for me to step up because I've been serving serving for years, uh, you know, supporting the UW um, a church. And now I thought it's time to get back to uh, a city where I've lived for the last uh, uh, 50 years. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, any clarifying questions for Bill? Okay, um, not seeing any. Um, thank you everybody again um, uh, for, oh, Alder Heck, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to offer an apology uh, concerning the Board of Review. I was absolutely wrong, Peter. The Board of Review does still exist, but I'm glad I, I asked because obviously I had confusion about what it does. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alder Heck. Um, Okay, um, so at this time, um, what we're going to do is um, uh, all alders um, should uh, uh, on CCEC should have a um, invitation to uh, pivot um, to go ahead and rank their choices. Um, I see uh, at least half of us um, have already logged in. Um, anybody has any uh, questions or problems, let me know. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, tally those results and uh, let people know um, who's in the next round. Um, while we do that, um, I, I do want to just remind everybody, um, uh, all the candidates tonight, um, that even if you are not selected, um, I highly recommend um, checking out our vacancies on our city committees. Um, we have a ton, a ton of city committees um, where you can get involved. And I also encourage you to consider um, running. Um, I know some have made it clear they have no intention of doing that, regardless of whether or not they're the pick, but but others, um, you know, there's this is a, a job where we certainly um, need candidates and want candidates. Um, at, at the conclusion of this interview, I'll certainly be sending you some links um, so you can learn more about our committees and the vacancies, as well as um, you know uh, what's, what's necessary to run in the spring. Um, so with that in mind, um, we're just gonna pause for a moment um, while uh, alders vote and uh, we'll go from there. President Furman. Did you announce what happened to Gary Paulson? Oh, um, sorry, I apologize. I did not do that for, for the people who don't know. Um, Gary withdrew um, from consideration yesterday. That's why he's not with us uh, this evening. Looks like we're just waiting for three more alders to vote, but everybody is in and picking their choices and uh, I'll have some more information in a moment.
Okay, um, we, we do have um, uh, results uh, for our next round. Uh, again, I do wanna thank um, uh, everybody for their participation um, uh, in uh, no particular order. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Jesse uh, uh, coming to our next round. Um, we have um, Nick and Bill. Um, so I wanna thank everybody else. Um, you're more than welcome to stay for round two. Uh, and uh, we'll jump right into it. Um, so for round two, I just want everybody to know, uh, so I want the alders to know that uh, somebody had pointed out to me that the questions I sent out are the same questions what we did use for District 20, um, but I did write um, District 20 in the email that you received. Um, so if you have a question that actually states the district, please say District 11 and not District 20. Um, on your um, sheets, um, uh, candidate one, um, um, would be uh, Jesse, um, candidate two um, would be Nick, and candidate three would be Bill. Um, I'll go ahead and send out a pivot link in a few moments um, and uh, give everybody one, one or two moments to quickly update their Excel spreadsheets um, if they wanna be taking notes there. And then um, uh, we'll go ahead and have Jesse up first and Alder Bennett, whenever you're ready, why don't you go ahead and start with uh, uh, your question. Thanks. I just need to pull up the, here I have the form right. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so Jesse, what knowledge, skills, and resources do you already possess that will help you become an effective interim alder? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks for carrying me into this next round. Um, I, I mentioned this uh, prior in the introduction, but um, I kind of go back to my experience, and, and this has been the last eight years of my professional um, work at UW System Administration. It's the project and change management that I do. Um, in, in my current role at UW System Administration, I, I interact daily and, and lead our communications. Communication, communication, communication. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Uh, I lead our communications, customer service, training, web teams. Uh, in this role, we've we've kind of refined a methodology to take any change and formulate a, a strategy to address and engage and communicate or train impacted stakeholders. So I, I know I use stakeholders before. Of course, this is uh, of course we're talking about constituents here, uh, but the the same methodology applies to pushing forward and engaging. Um, any type of change. So key factors in my current role, getting the right people involved, starting communication early and often, identifying audiences and their changes is key, uh, and then getting ahead of identified risks. I mean, those are key pieces of any change uh, that for me in my work, that is what I zone in on. Um, and that's what I really take in even this position, uh, working with our neighborhoods and uh, constituents on on how to propose and lay out a foundation of change. Uh, the other skill I wanted to mention is is a very process oriented mindset. Uh, it kind of goes back to the work that I do, but having a strategic communication plan, listing out specific details for audiences, um, timing delivery, uh, communication channels. I mentioned this in the introduction. Uh, I feel like there's so much to be said about both the engagement piece of of communication on both side, both sides, but also the channels that we utilize and and who we're utilizing them for. There's a question down the <laughs> down there regarding you know how do you how do you get through to people that aren't necessarily tapped into these main channels, um, and it just highlights the need to diversify your portfolio um, as, as to uh, a way to engage with, with our constituents. Um, I would say, I would say knowledge is probably, I, I'd probably use my um, experience as a board member for the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association right now. I, I got roped in uh, 2017. It was just a, a friend and neighbor of mine. And she has said, Hey, come jump on a meeting. And um, the rest is history, I guess. So uh, just uh, two months ago, I was elected um, unanimously uh, from the board as president. Um, and I just kind of wanted to walk through a couple main things that I've uh, brought into the neighborhood um, or tried to work through um, that I I feel like there's been a lot of value added. So first of all, um, we started a biannual survey to get a good gauge on the neighborhood. Um, we had ours sent out two years ago, so we are due. 
uh, to kind of use our benchmark survey from two years ago and see where we're at with those items. Uh, helped create multiple online payment options for Westmoreland. Uh, we migrated our database into a new SQL database. Uh, we created an online membership form to streamline ways to gather data and be able to create reports that are helpful for neighbors, block captains, et cetera. Uh, we've streamlined communications via email, Facebook, new newsletter, our listserv. Um, and, and right now, uh, my, my main goal is to uh, continually plug in people. There's, there's so much talent around the city. It's, it's insane. And, and my role right now is to try to get people from our neighborhood and get them into the right spots uh, within our neighborhood association. Um, and, and even two months ago, I've been able to recruit three board members and four coordinators for our uh, committee. So um, I don't know what that says about my influence or persuasion, but um, it's, been, it's been great so far. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention then, uh, resources. Um, I interact with neighborhoods already uh, as the president, as a board member, I was vice president before this. So I already have a lot of familiarity with the different types of communication channels um that we use and uh, uh that would be used for engagement for with with constituents so um yeah that's that's what i want to mention in terms of uh skills resources knowledge uh that i bring to the interim alder any questions oh th thank you jesse well we're going to do questions at the end um we're, so sure. we'll do clarifying questions at the end and so um the next the next thing we'll do is uh older conklin has the next question for you uh, Alder Conklin, go ahead. Thank you, President Furman. Hi, Jesse. Um, now, this is a long question, so please don't hesitate to ask me to repeat it or whatever you need. But yep. please, please describe the ways you practice and demonstrate equity and inclusion and how you would model these practices in this assignment. Please provide an example of measure you have taken to further your knowledge of equity, inclusion, and racial justice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a great question um, because, um, you know, quite honestly, it's one of those things where um, you can experience these types of things any every day in some way, shape, or form. But um, I, I wanted to talk to a few relevant pieces of my experiences with, with this. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, I worked with James Gray. He was a very influential uh, UW-Madison consultant. Uh, we developed two workshops together. So my background is in instructional design. Um, we created the courses, Understanding and Addressing Unconscious Bias, and then Cultural Competence. Uh, these were both taught at the university. Uh, the Understanding and Addressing Unconscious Bias dove into the topics of the mind, why it's important in today's workforce, provided practical applications for strategic strategies to address biases, um, and then use the Project Implicit website. It's really neat. I, I should show share the uh, link after this, regardless of all things. Um, and this is a benchmark to determine bias before. And then we also use that um, benchmark after the workshop. So there was a qualitative questions in the pre and post unconscious bias assessment to determine the positive shift in development. So that was some of the results. Um, and then the other course, the cultural confidence, this was a four hour session navigating through the topics of current culture, diversity related tensions, how, individual, uh, how individuals respond to differences, skills for engaging uh, courageous conversations. And then again, practical applications for implementing new behaviors that are conscious acts of inclusion. This course had a pre and post cultural competency assessment. Zero was none, five was expert. And results from the folks in UW Madison Business School shifted from an average of 2.8, which was novice competent, to uh, 3.9 uh, competent and proficient after the course. So I guess that was one example of uh, trying to get a as objective measurement as you can for something like this. Um, and I guess my last thing that I wanted to mention, I didn't even have this jotted down in my notes, but it's it's just one of those things where um, it's been with me. I. I still teach, I'm current teacher at Concordia University, of Wisconsin. We don't have a branch here in Madison anymore. So I, I don't know, I, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I, I just want to mention that I had almost completely non-traditional students in every single course that I taught, both at the undergraduate and I had a few graduate level courses. And I would say 
the the level of respect that I had gotten as an instructor was was a direct result of the um, was the fairness and and the equity and 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 being equal and providing a fair chance at everybody and uh, opening up discussion and leveraging people's at work experiences in the classroom. And so I it's I'm not trying to give myself a pat on the back, but I think the the vast amount of respect that I got from uh, these non-traditional students, I mean, professionals in the workforce for 20, 30, 40 years, and uh, just providing the utmost respect for me, I think that was a testament in terms of how I treated them as a student in the class. So I, I just wanted to mention that because I think that was a really good example of just how I condone myself in, in a classroom or in professional environment, or in this case, um, our common council meetings. Thank you, Alder Conklin. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Jesse. Our next question will be from Alder Foster. Good evening, Jesse. Um, tell us about what you see as some of the critical issues uh, facing District 11 and also uh, some of the critical issues facing the city. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit more in tune with this, just being on the board at Westmoreland. Uh, I mean, obviously, the public transit, uh, the Metro Forward agenda, this is one of the hot topics, of course, uh, through the city. Uh, but right now, particularly in our neighborhood, we have a lot of uh, representation going to the public meetings and bringing it back to our um, our community, our neighborhood. Um, and so that's, that's still kind of top in mind uh, in terms of you know, it really comes down to some of the routes that people have been relying on and um, feel, you know, entitled to in a way where you know, it's part of our tax dollars, et cetera. And um, the thought of having those routes eliminated is, is a really big deal for them. Um, and I, I, I hear them. Uh, the, the next topic I would mention, again, this, <laughs> anybody could argue this is, uh, this is both city too, but business and housing development. Um, as you know, um, there was uh, the first initial um, development that was passed on Speedway, uh, the prior gas station there. Um, this is a big one because it kind of sets the precedent of uh, future development in this area. Um, and, and while I don't have, you know, a, a strong opinion on one side or the other, my take is that I want to balance, uh, you know, business and housing development su support while also preserving, you know, meaningful city uh, and or historic lots. So, it's it's a balancing act, and then I think um, you know that's my approach to to that topic. Uh, and then finally, of course, green infrastructure. This is this could be the city, of course, um, but at least within our neighborhood um, and District Eleven, there's been a lot going on in terms of uh, flood mitigation strategies. And I I took part in uh, in a really great uh, workshop done by friends like Lingra. Um, there's some really really great stuff happening there. Um, there's there's other types of strategies as well uh, for flood mitigation. I think it's just one of those things where it's it's more marketing and offering educational pieces, uh, and people can do their fair share to help out uh, in each uh, lot of of their yard or whatever or whatever the case is. So that's that's District 11 um, city. Um, this one kind of goes without being said. Affordable housing. I know there's the housing forward agenda um, that's that's uh, found on the site right now. I don't really need to talk too much about that because I'm sure you're all well versed in there. Um, mental health is is the next topic. Um, this this one kind of lands a little bit closer to me. My my wife she's a therapist in mental health, and um, I don't know. Even before COVID, it was it was um, pretty alarming trend, especially with youth, in terms of the the types of behaviors that she's seeing, the types of thoughts she's hearing from these very young kids. Um, and that's that's just at a youth level. So she primarily only works with children um, anywhere from like five to 14, 15. Um, so that that's really uh, a, a really big concern for me. And I, you know, I know there's the CARES program um, that's out there right now, but that's that's near and dear to me because you know I have to, you know, I I, I don't have to, I hear about it quite often with my wife. I mean, we have children and she's, you know, she talks to me about these types of things and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really troubling, but also something that I'm really, um, a huge advocate for anything to advance, you know, assistance with either children or adults, uh, suffering from mental health. 
Uh, next topic I had here, and this this kind of came from a couple of years ago when when we had such you know such a, a you know tension between uh, our community and and police uh, police enforcement or law enforcement, and and that's just the idea of having a little bit more so support and collaboration. Even with our, our neighborhood right now, I'm working with our um, uh, Mineral Point uh, police station. We have a liaison dedicated just to Westmoreland. And you know, I've reached out to him, asked if he can come to our 4th of July event or an upcoming event in our neighborhood. And uh, it, it's just things like that where I, I firmly believe to get a little bit more involvement and even collaboration with neighborhood or neighborhoods. Um, that, and that's kind of a, I don't know, I feel like that's a, it's one of those things that you you get a lot of a lot of uh, polarizing views on, and and I I want to help find some middle ground somewhere. Um, and then finally, there's I don't know how much this really plays into the Common Council, but uh, the public sector workforce crisis. I mean, uh, the research indicates right now that compensation is is certainly part of the answer, but short term, but not necessarily long-term. Um, there was just some really good research by Mission Square Research, research Institute. Um, they point out factors of employee recognition, um, connection to its mission. In other words, employee engagement uh, and that being a really big impact on just uh, people phasing out of, of the public sector and not just people, really good employees phasing out of the public sector. And I think that's, I think that's a real, I think it's a real issue. Okay. So thanks, uh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> th thank you, Jesse. Our next question is from Alder Figueroa Cole. So I am having a little bit of issue with my speakers. So can you hear me? I can hear okay. you just fine. Thank okay. you. Perfect. So I'm just going to. <clears throat> Already. Um, Jesse, so you received a lot of feedback from residents surrounding a project in the district. Your general sense is 60% are in favor of the project and 40% are against it. How do you balance public feedback against policies, goals, and priorities? What steps did you take Alder for a roll call. We lost. We yeah. lost you on that. Um, do you want to? Uh, you were. You were asking um, the part we lost you. Do you want, want me to finish for you? You want to try Which again? Part, or, I, I um, we lost I, you on uh, how. How do you balance public? Okay, so let me just go go again one more time, please. You received a lot of feedback from residents surrounding a project in the district. Your general sense is 60% are in favor of the project and 40% are against it. How do you balance public feedback against policies, goals, and priorities? What steps do you take into consideration to arrive at your, at your position? Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is a really, this is a good question. And I, I had put a lot of thought into it uh, in terms of my answer and um, yeah, I. I actually have a pretty simple, pretty, pretty simple answer to this because I think part of the answer can actually be found in the question itself. Um, I know, uh, you know, a lot of issues are not cut and dry, obviously, um, but I would base my decision making on the city's mission and ask myself, is this an element of great city? And if so, does it align with our values? I would base my decision on that outcome that answers the previous questions and serves our common good. And I think the, the premise here is the common good. Um, so yeah, I, you know, what I went through, I, I really want to kind of get myself well adversed with the, with the mission and values and equity and um, to kind of go through that. And I just kept on coming back to, yes, there, you, you have the elements of great city, government, uh, economy, green, land use, health, uh, neighborhood housing. Uh, but it all comes back to the quality service for the common good of our residents and visitors. And I don't know about you all, but if if you can find a way to uh, put forth and be in favor of a project and relate it back to the mission and values of our city, 
I think that's that's about as as good of an answer as you can provide, or at least framing it back to the nature and our um, thread of of the city of Madison. And so, uh, you know, I guess I'll just wrap up and say that part of my decision making is is coming back to the values instilled of the city and and our mission, and and the premise being the common good. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Our next question will be from uh, Alder Heck. Finally, I'm there. Thank you. Too many windows open. Um, Jesse, uh, how do you reach District 20 residents who are not engaged in traditional ways like neighborhood associations? Well, that's a great question because I didn't even know we were part of District 11 until maybe a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it, it actually took uh, a little bit of effort just to figure out, you know, to subscribe to our Venus emails um, and to kind of get looped in uh, there. But, uh, you know, kind of goes back to what we are trying to do uh, with our Westmoreland Neighborhood Association, but obviously a little bit larger scale with the district. Um, I, I already see it, but we use, you know, for the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association, we use multiple channels of communication. We, of course, use email. We use Facebook. We use our website. Uh, we are using QR codes a lot heavier now um, rather than, you know, typing in a URL for something. It seems kind of silly when you can just, you know, put your camera up to it and it'll take you to whatever that site uh, may be. Uh, another thing that I would like to do if if I was a district 11 alder is is really make sure that we are timing things out properly with all of the couriers or newsletters for each of the neighborhoods. I don't know if it's the case for every single neighborhood that they do have a newsletter, but I do know uh, from what I've seen on the websites that for the majority, there are both hard, hard copy and then also um, soft versions that are uploaded to the website. But it would be, you know, there's a timing element to get a presence established there where you can provide contact information, office information, if that's applicable still with, with this role. Um, another one that I, I was kind of thinking about, and um, it, it's kind of the idea of having an open drop-in session. So we had we had our first hybrid style uh, board meeting last, um, last month. It was kind of it was interesting because I haven't run a hybrid style meeting yet where people were in person. And then, um, of course, we had a Zoom call going on too. And I would really like to try and establish some type of cadence with having these types of hybrid drop-in sessions, whether it's you know people just not having the time to drive wherever you are, or if it's a health-related issue, um, not wanting to be in person, whatever the case is, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to offer these hybrid uh, formats of in-person, Zoom, or whatever, you know, uh, video conference tool you use. Uh, and then finally, um, in terms of reaching out to District 11 residents, I don't think that there's any substitute greater than just making physical appearances, being there in person, seeing people, marketing yourself, handshakes, if if that's called for, I guess, at the time. It's still a little goofy post-COVID with, with some of that stuff. but. Um, you know, making that physical appearance and, and making yourself present in, in front of your district. I think it's really important. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Jesse. Um, that concludes uh, our questions, but I do want to give CCEC members an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions based on Jesse's responses. Okay, uh, not seeing any. Uh, thank you again, Jesse. We're gonna uh, move to our next candidate, um, which is Nick. Um, hi, thank Nick. You. Um, uh, your first question uh, will be from Alder Bennett. Sweet, hello, Nick. Hello. Uh, okay, hold on. Too many tabs. Uh, okay, what knowledge, skills, and resources do you already possess that will help you become an effective interim alder. Thank you, and once again, thank you all for spending yet another meeting doing this work. Uh, my answer to this, as well as to I think the other ones, will be well within five minutes. 
So as an 11 month lame duck alder, I would be in an unusual position. On the one hand, I couldn't expect to contribute nearly as effectively as I might if I were a longstanding member of the council and its committees. On the other hand, I wouldn't be constrained by the prospect of reelection from voicing my honest opinion on any issue. I don't claim to be an expert on most or even maybe even any of the issues that come before the common council. I follow the local news. I've read Alder Martin's blog postings. I attend our Hill Farms planning committee meetings. However, if appointed, I would have to apply myself seriously immediately to understanding more than just the superficialities of the issues that are likely to come up. I would also want to meet and establish good working relationships with the staff that support the Common Council, as well as staff in other city offices. And without being pushy or self-important, I would want to introduce myself to my all of my council colleagues to lay a foundation for communication. I would certainly contact Alder Martin for information and advice, which I had decided not to do before today. And I would immediately contact all the neighborhood associations besides Hill Farms to schedule a get up to speed meeting. One personal quality I might contribute to council and committee members would be my background as an administrative law judge, ALJ, in which I developed a strong habit of staying in the middle on issues as long as possible, listening to both sides, remaining uncommitted until all the evidence was in before finally voicing an opinion or taking a position. I also understand the importance of procedural rules for the conduct of meetings. And though I haven't had to use Robert's rules for some time, I would refamiliarize re -familiarize myself with them or with whatever variation the Common Council uses. And this may not be terribly relevant, but having just referred to my professional experience as an ALJ, I'll just mention my Mac background at the law school and the Supreme Court, which involved teaching and enforcing rules of professional conduct and ethics. I'm not sure how it might come up in the context of the Common Council. I'm not sure what rules of professional conduct might even apply to committee members or council members, but I happen to be very sensitive to ethical issues and I would find out right away what rules may apply. Those are skills and resources I would bring. Uh, thank you, Nick. Our next question will be from Alder Conklin. Hi, Nick. Hello. Give me one second here. Um, please describe the ways you practice and demonstrate equity and inclusion and how you would model these practices in this assignment. Please provide an example of measure you have taken to further your knowledge of equity, inclusion, and racial justice. As Jesse said, great question. And I will admit that I'm very impressed by his courses in implicit biases, et cetera, and a lot of his other responses. Personally, I try to treat people, I won't say all equally, that's not actually fair, but treat them according to their merits without regard to externalities. Um, I've always done that. And although I can't absolutely swear to be free of unconscious biases, I like to think that I avoid ascribing qualities to people based on their race or ethnicity or gender, with gender extending to LGBTQ plus identities. And if anything, I may unconsciously lean in what might be considered the opposite direction, perhaps making allowances for people whose lives have been made harder by their race, ethnicity, or gender than mine ever was. Um, there is one area I'm weak in, and it bothers me. I'm not particularly successful in my relations to people with some physical disabilities. Uh, in a couple of my groups, there are people who are wheelchair bound with a condition like ALS that makes them almost impossible for them to communicate verbally, and I find myself avoiding them. Um, I simply don't like to be able to un unable to understand what someone is saying, and, and it makes me feel incompetent, uncomfortable, and somehow disrespectful. So I'm failing them, but if I had to work with such a person, I would figure out a way to communicate them. That's just a sort of a personal disclaimer, sorry. But back to what I can point to, as evidence that I am sensitive to and involved in efforts to be just, equitable, and inclusive, I've created one initiative 
And in order to further my understanding, I've attended some groups and read some books. The initiative involved minority owned businesses. I currently happen to be the president of the board of the Free Congregation in Sauk County, and we have a biweekly newsletter for our members. Two years ago, in an effort to raise awareness of the presence of minorities in the local community and their contributions, I had members of the congregation contact minority-owned businesses in the area, and month by month, we gave each of them a free ad in our newsletter with a message urging our members to patronize them. As for groups, I have actually looked for activist groups that I might join, but I haven't found one yet that seems focused on the issues of greatest interest to me and that isn't a little too vehement in its approach. I intensely dislike the current extremists on the right, but I've also become wary of self-righteous extremism on the left. Uh, in 2019, I attended training for the Court Observer Program run by the Nehemia, is that how you pronounce it? Center for Urban Leadership Development and Justified Anger. And for a few months, I watched and reported on court proceedings. Around the same time, I attended a couple of meetings of Moses, a group of within the Wisdom Network of faith-based organizations. I applauded their work, but I just didn't feel that their issue was what I wanted to commit the time and energy that could be needed. I'm on many social justice mailing lists. I regularly receive communications. Uh, one of them is from an online group called Taking a Faithful Stand for Equity, sponsored by Wisdom, the Wisconsin Council of Churches, Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice, MICA, and the Wisconsin Council of Rabbis. And I have attended some of their training sessions. Uh, but I'm not currently, I have not chosen to join any of those groups. And finally, I do a fair amount of reading. As for books, I've read most of CAST. Um, I started the introspective journaling recommended, perhaps some of you know the work, Me and White Supremacy, uh, Combating Racism, Changing the World and Becoming a Good Answer, Ancestor. So I try to keep myself informed. Um, I try to listen to other people tell me what I should be doing, and I try to find exactly the right outlet for it. But um, I'm still sort of floundering on that. That's my answer. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, the next question will be from Alder Foster. Thanks, Nick. Um, what are some of the critical issues facing your district and uh, critical issues facing the city that you're aware of? And I will even have to narrow that because based on what I've you know spent my time doing over many, many years, I know the Hill Farms neighborhood really well. Um, the concept of District 11 is new to me, uh, only since I found out about this opportunity. <clears throat> so I know the issues of my neighborhood really well. I can extend some of them safely to the rest of the district and even some of them safely to the city. Um, but I don't feel overly competent in extending it much beyond that. Um, one of my first actions, if I were appointed, would be to contact, first of all, contact all the other neighborhood associations in District 11. Uh, to ask about their issues and to get more up to speed on the, as well as get up, up to speed on the city's range of concerns. Uh, as for Hill Farms, the issue I see come up most often is public transportation, specifically the city's plans for bus rapid transit and metro redesign. Um, I think these are issues that are of great salience to the city as well as, as, as and to the district. So the transit-oriented development overlay zoning promotes zoning within a half to one quarter to one half mile on either side of the route to allow for more dense development. This would conflict with our Hill Farms National Historic District rules. And so uh, I know that within our neighborhood, we have had people who have negotiated and talked with the city. And I think actually our neighborhood is being excluded from that time at this time. Uh, the residents are, of course, also re concerned that the Metro Transit re Network redesign plan will cut bus routes and make public transportation less convenient. Um, and again, I feel sure that this is an issue that will be uh, throughout District 11, uh, as well as many parts of the city. Beyond transportation issues, 
Hill Farms residents are intensely concerned about preserving their distinctive neighborhood. This would be true of other neighborhoods, as well as maintaining amenities such as parkland, um, despite the increasing density of, and traffic impact of so many building products projects all around the city. Uh, some of the residents of the neighborhood expressed concern over the city's budget, whether it's going to be maintainable um, year after year, and its effect on property taxes. So there's always concern about policing, even though our neighborhood, and I think much of District 11, is relatively safe part of the city. There are always concerns voiced over policing, uh, having patrols for neighborhood safety, speeding, and um, different views on body cams and the CARES initiative. Beyond the district boundaries, and this would be citywide and even, I think, uh, regional, uh, there are many residents who are concerned about long-term solutions to homelessness, as well as regional planning for waste and water resources. And that's my answer. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Our next uh, question will come from Alder Figueroa Cole. That won't be Jesse, but it'll be from uh, Nick. I'm sorry. That's all right. My apologies. It's been a long <clears throat> week. Hi, Nick. Um, okay, you receive a lot of feedback from residents surrounding a, pro a project in the district. Your general sense is 60% are in favor of the project and 40% are against it. How do you balance public feedback against policies, goals, and priorities? What steps do you take into consideration to arrive at your position? Thank you. Uh, if this were a totally non-controversial and almost insub insubstantial issue, something like pla placing a plaque honoring someone in a local park, I just choose that as something that over which there would be very little controversy. Uh, though perhaps pro and con, I would support what I perceive to be the majority opinion uh, in my district. And that's a simple reflection of the fact that the district expects its alder to be its voice in the council. Um, and if I served for a long time, I would develop a knowledge of the residents involved, the reasons for their concern, such as proximities to projects or past involvement, et cetera, et cetera. And as for how to arrive at a position for somewhat more substantial but relatively routine projects, I would probably expect to get an awful lot of my information from Legistar and the Common Council meetings, the information that is provided to the council ahead of time by staff. But for issues and projects that deserve serious attention, I would do more research, clearly. Um, in today's world, with so much available information from so many sources, um, I have found that rather than trying to do a lot of the research myself, the most effective and efficient way to inform myself is to talk to well-informed individuals. That would start with city staff, as well as experts in the neighborhood. Um, as just three examples, I've been in enough meetings of the Hill Farms Planning Committee to know that Gary Peterson is an expert on planning and sustainability issues. Joe Keyes is an expert on transport issues, transit issues. Diana Penkunis is an expert on historic preservation. I would get information from people whose opinions I respect. Um, so I would do research that way. End of answer. Thank you, Nick. Um, our next question will be from Alder Huck. Nick, how do you reach District 11 residents who are not engaged in traditional ways like neighborhood associations? Good question. This answer will also be very short. Um, neighborhood associations are a great source of information and many of the residents get that information. In Hill Farms, at least, I suspect in many of the other neighborhoods, uh, at least one of the quarterly newsletters or equivalents goes out to every person in the neighborhood, uh, regardless of whether they're a member. That's a source of, uh, of information. The Alders blog posts, um, 
are an excellent source. They have been a constant source of information for me, and they can reach many people who don't happen to be members of the association. Uh, the alder should show up at events and meet people and talk to them and maybe encourage them to become more involved one way or another. The alder can send postcards to all addresses, uh, which has been an effective way of notifying residents of upcoming neighborhood meetings or planning meetings, et cetera, events. Um, the neighborhood associations have websites, which may be visited by residents, even if they aren't members. And um, finally, as was mentioned before, uh, there are other media ways of reaching people, Facebook pages, next door presence, et cetera. So we would try to use all of those in order to reach uh, everyone on an issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Any clarifying questions for Nick based on any of his responses? Not seeing any, thank you again, Nick. Um, we're gonna move on to our next candidate, um, Bill. Uh, Bill, your first question uh, will be from Alder Bennett. Um, I will remind you that um, you get five minutes uh, for each question. Alder, Alder Bennett, uh, Alder Conklin, go ahead. Can you just give us just a second so I can get my notes in here, please? Yeah, absolutely. So we're just gonna pause for one moment. Everybody take a deep breath and make sure they've got their notes also all settled and then we'll get going. Once Alder Conklin puts her hand down, I will see that as a sign that we should resume. Okay, all right, um, uh, Bill, welcome. Um, your first question will be from Alder Bennett. Lit. Okay, so Bill, what knowledge, skills, and resources do you already possess that will help you become an effective interim Alder? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think one resource I may need to invest in if selected is a, is a more comfortable chair. This is uh, getting ready for uh, some life. I've, I've been serving on the uh, Academic Staff Executive Committee on campus, and we, we have long meetings, but uh, um, I think I'm going to get myself ready for, uh, for some marathon. Um, as I mentioned before, I've, um, I've been living in the, in the area for, for 50 years. I know the people, the places. I attend many of the events. Um, that make this District 11 such a, a great place to live. Um, you know, my uh, my wife and I, when we moved back to Madison after just a brief stint out east, uh, you know, we 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 looked for housing in in, in uh, District uh, 11. This is uh, a neighborhood that uh, it had all the amenities that 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 we were looking for. Um, I want to add that I, I stress I'm not I'm not an administrator. I've never never been one, um, and uh, I've always seen myself as as kind of in, in an advocate role. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a uh, an artist by training, a videographer. You know, I I watch, observe, um, and I work on the ground with 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 students, staff, um, in creating a wide variety of of, of programs and courses. Um, like I said, I participate in shared governance for many years. I represent you know, I've been representing over 10,000 academic staff. I've learned Robert rules. I have uh, a, a copy of my great grandfather's uh, book from uh, over 100 years old. Um, uh, he was a, one of the early early lawyers at, at DW uh, Law School. My great my my great aunt was one of the first women to graduate from law school. Um, you know, um, but I think one thing I'm I'm I've learned from having a, a you know is in my time in 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 shared governance is is I'm not really somebody who shies away from controversy. I will, I, you know, I tend to be very soft-spoken, but I, I, I will dive right into uh, to an issue if I think it, it best represents uh, the people that I'm, I'm representing. Um, one of the most recent, I mean, I, I was very involved with the uh, decision that, that President Ray Cross made a number of years ago about restructuring UW system, which caused quite a bit of uh, turmoil for, uh, for all campuses, especially Madison. I advocated for all the UW extension staff. They got displaced. Many of them came back to Madison. Um, or work, work with them to welcome them and to make sure that they got when they transitioned here that they were uh, given the 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 uh, 
the privilege and the rights of being an employee for so many years. When you when you move, when you take a job at the UW, you come to another place, you you lose your uh, priorities in your um, in you know in um, basically as how, as as in um, parking, um, other areas like that. So they they now their years of service count when they came to Madison. Um, I also was very involved with with the uh, the controversy topic of remote work. Uh, I took the side. We had so many staff who were working remote in some departments or over, uh, you know, when the university went uh, into kind of uh, lockdown because of COVID and, you know, supervisors were, were allowing staff to work remote, but we had no policy on this to support that. So I helped advocate and pushed forth a, uh, a resolution to create a re you know, remote work policy that didn't sit well with, with the chancellor, the provost, but yet it was the right decision. And uh, it's now the, uh, the official policy on our on our campus, um, and uh, uh, I guess the um, yeah, I guess those are those are kind of the skill sets that 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 I do have. I kind of like I said, I hit I would be hitting the ground running, um, coming off of some um, yeah some very uh, controversial issues, but yet um, I I even though I am not a, sometimes challenged, you know the uh, the the uh, authority on campus, I'm still all on good terms with both the uh, with both our, our Chancellor Blank, who's just leaving us, and also uh, uh, interim uh, Chancellor uh, Carl Schultz, who, who whose dinner party I'm missing tonight to attend this event. So, uh, um, but uh, so uh, again, I, I I keep I keep any uh, debate and and uh, and discussions within the context of the meeting, and uh, and I don't I don't take those things outside. I don't. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Bill. Our next question will be from Alder Conklin. Hi, Bill. Hello. Please describe the ways you practice and demonstrate equity and inclusion, and how you would model these practices and assignment in this assignment. Excuse me. Please provide an example of measure. Of measure. I'm sorry. Please provide an example of measure you have taken to further your knowledge of equity, inclusion, and racial justice. Please let me know if you need me to read that again. I apologize. No, I got it. I, I um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess I would start by saying I've used my my time and talent to to, and probably what I'm most proud about is to advocate for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, I've worked very closely with the Weisman Center and the School of Social Work for years um, and to provide uh, not only course material, um, but also to, to educate uh, parents and guardians of indi individuals with, with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, I worked to uh, uh, help to deinstitutionalize a number of, of individuals in our state uh, uh, institutions and have them come back into the community, not only to be uh, included into our, our public schools, but also to um, to be uh, members of our society and work in, and work in the community, and not not be put in sheltered uh, uh, work environments. Um, you know that was a number of years ago. I still stay in touch with folks. Um, in fact, it's very it's uh, it's neat to see that some of the students that that worked with me on these early courses are now in positions where they are teaching classes. Um, I, again, I should add that when I started at the, at the UW, I was only uh, uh, just turned 21. So they hired me at a very young age for, uh, for a position that I've had for, for quite some time. Um, you know, I, I, I sent you my resume and I think you, you saw that I've, I've been very pri privileged to have a, a world-class education, not only at the UW, but also I, I've, I was also out at Dartmouth College for a number of years, you know, and I recognize that I would not you know, be where I am today uh, if it wasn't for uh, a high school teacher that uh, reached out to, to my father and supported him. My father comes from a very uh, poor family and it was a high school teacher who provided the funding for him to come to the, to the UW. And it was that, that act of kindness that kind of, uh, that's, that really has always stuck, stuck with me. And I have pretty much used my time and, and skills to, uh, to give back and make and, and allow uh, different ways for people to access the university who otherwise did not think that they were uh, able to. Um, and I mentioned the Odyssey program already. 
And, uh, you know, but I've also been developing, you know, some of the early courses and programs in our online degree programs. And again, other controversial issue that the UW did not want to do in the early days um, and was, uh, the, was one of the individuals that I, I think created the, some of the first online distance education courses, um, which we've now turned into uh, full professional master's degree programs. So over 5,000 students are currently in our programs. And then also just launching the online undergraduate program. Um, um, in addition to that, I've done a lot of non-credit programs, working with the, uh, the George Mossy program. And we've been creating courses on the uh, uh, rise of nationalism, racism, and anti-Semitism, and most recently, the history of sexuality in Germany in the 1930s. And what we found is that if we look at, uh, explore kind of uh, you know, that period of history in Germany, it really provides an excellent way to, to look at some of the, uh, the current events in our society. Um, and, uh, and again, that, that, that has been an excellent way for us to, to kind of, in, you know, encourage, enlighten, and, and shed, shed light on some issues that other people will not talk about. In fact, we had the, the class on, on the history of sexuality, we had faculty from all over the, the globe who participated because they couldn't teach topic, they couldn't teach courses like this in, in their countries. Um, I've also invented, you mentioned some, 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 some books. I, I was also in, in my division where we created a, a book club uh, because so, you know, it, it is uh, talking about uh, white privilege, racism is uncomfortable for a lot of people. We created a, a book club uh, and, uh, and brought a lot of people to, uh, to discuss this, this, uh, these issues. So I'm, that's how I, uh, I, I report to our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, uh, person in my division and, uh, and the book club is, and, and the readings is, is one way that I use to kind of, uh, kind of uh, inform myself and, and talk about difficult topics with, with others. So I hope that was under five minutes, but. Uh, it, was, it was, thank you, Bill. Wow, okay. Um, our next question is gonna come from Alder Foster. Hey, Bill. Uh, what, are, what are some of the critical issues facing District 11 and what are some of the critical issues facing the city? Well, I, I, one benefit of having the last name with starting with a T is I get to go last. And I think some of the other people have, have touched on some of the, some of the big ones. Um, um, I do think public transportation, transportation is, is probably, you know, front and center for district 11. And, uh, I'll just admit that I am, uh, you know, I am, I keep, I keep driving way too much, um, to campus. It's, it's only three miles away. I should be biking, but my wife, uh, depends on the bus. And, uh, and so she has, uh, she has really brought that, that issue to my attention. Plus I have, uh, you know, I have kids who rely on the bus too, to get her, get around. Um, you know, I, I was a, at first concerned about, you know, not having uh, a bus that, you know, uh, that kind of cuts through along, um, you know, speedway. Um, uh, but it looks like there's going to be some, uh, some that that's actually might be in there. The one thing I, I, I don't really see is there's, we, we really plan our bus routes north, you know, going to east to west. We don't have a lot of north to south, um, you know, but I think busing is, is a big issue. But on top of that, I think uh, transportation in general is an issue for District 11. Um, you know, uh, you know, when I was really, really small, you know, the, uh, you know, District 11 was on the edge of the city, you know, it, it wasn't much beyond that. Um, you know, we, we designed this, this community mainly in the 1950s, centered around the automobile. We have a lot of broad streets. Um, now we have, uh, the city has grown well, well beyond District 11. And we have a lot of our, our kind of our bedroom communities, um, you know, you know in, in Verona and Middleton and uh, Wanakee, you know, is creating a lot of additional traffic that that cuts through our District 11. And um, you know, one of the things that 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 you know, growing up, this district was always a safe, walkable neighborhood. And I get concerned uh, with the just the amount of traffic and the amount of speed that people uh, you know do drive at peak times of the uh, of the day. Um, we also mentioned, you know, water. I think that's another issue. Um, you know, this is one of the highest points in Madison. Everything flows down from from District 11, and we need to be really uh, aware of what we're putting on our lawns, how we have our uh, how we do how we have our gutters positioned. Um, and again, I'm a son of a, of a landscape architect, um, so I 
I grew up with, uh, you know, uh, in, in the environment of, of urban planning and historic preservation and landscape architecture. Um, the last thing I think is I work in, in, in media. And I think one thing that, that you know, we, when I go to different events, I ask people what they do. Most people, you know, what they, we talk about what's your, what's your profession. Most people in this area seem to either say they work in uh, for the university, the hospital, or, or they work for uh, a company that's, that's outside of, of uh, you know, this, 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 uh, this, this area and they work online. And I think one thing that we need to, it's an issue not only for, for uh, District 11, but I think for all of Madison is to make sure that we're well positioned to, to have, uh, you know, the broadband access to get ready for the, the 5G that's going to be, that's being implemented. Um, and then make sure that it's not just, we're not just sending, having uh, high speed access just for those, you know, kind of wealthier neighborhoods like District 11, but we provide that for, for all, all, all neighborhoods. And I think that sometimes it's that digital divide that, that creates a lot of the inequity in our society. So I'll, I'll, I think that I'll end on, I think that's under five minutes still, or am I? Oh yeah, okay. that's under five. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, our next question will be from Alder Figueroa Cole. <clears throat> um, hi, Bill. I think I, I'm still going to make it here. Okay. Sorry okay. about my my um, voice going in and out here. So you receive a lot of feedback from residents surrounding a project in the district. Your general sense is 60% are in favor of the project and 40% are against it. How do you balance public feedback against policies, goals, and priorities? What steps do you take into consideration to arrive at your position? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I think I'd listen. I would not make I make a point not to express, you know, any any you know my my opinions going this any biases I might have, uh, weigh both sides. I also would try I would try to get you know, 60-40 is, is, is a good divide, but I would try to, you know, uh, I would try to get, get, create a little more consensus, but I also would speak with, with the uh, city staff, um, you know, it's fine, learn more about the issue from them. Those, you know, I, I, I again, I've been a, a public servant for, for years. I trust the people who stay and choose to work in, in, uh, in, in uh, public uh, uh, service. Um, I also would talk to, to other alders learn more about the issue and then in the end I would I would I would just like I've done other topics I would trust my gut and vote what for what I think is best for district 11 first and then I also look what's best for the city hope that answers uh, that yep. thank you yeah thank you Bill our uh, last question will be from Alder Heck Bill, uh, how do you how do you reach District 11 residents who are not engaged in traditional ways like neighborhood associations? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. I, I, again, I'm thinking back to to how I kind of you know kind of learn you know learn more about the issues. I um, uh, you know the 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 school PTOs. I think um, like I mentioned before, we have. Uh, you know, we have, I was, when I was looking at the district, I, I, I think it's, we have more places of worship than we do bars. I thought that was, I, something, I was very, you know, that says a lot about District 11. I think I would reach out to our, our, our uh, those communities. Um, I think communicate, I work in communications. I see the value of, of, of being effective communicator. I also see the value of just, you know, showing up and being, and, and talking to people, make, you know, being, being present. Um, you know, and one thing I would like, you know, would, would like to do is, is not just, not just walk and greet people at different events, but also to uh, something we've done on, on, on some of the other committees I've been on groups is that we, we create listening sessions and we advertise that and we encourage people to walk in and, and, and talk. Um, and that's something, that's one way to really learn, um, learn what people are, are thinking. Um, you know, that's that the other thing is that I think, uh, that I've, I've done and we've done before is we, you know, we create, um, you know, I've been very involved with, with creating, uh, lectures, creating events, creating opportunities. And I would, I would look, you know, to bring you know, on topics that, you know, that, that, uh, of interest to, to the district, I would look to bring in 
in experts and guest speakers to, to do talks and use that as an opportunity not only to educate people in the community, but also the chance to get to know more people in, the, uh, in, 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 uh, in my district. Uh, and I would use the, the public spaces that we have, like the public library, the schools, um, but I also would use some of the local, uh, local businesses. I think coffee shops are a great place. Maybe, uh, maybe rent out, uh, you know, maybe get access to the, the, to the theater at, at Hilldale, for example, another spot, you know, show, you know, help. Uh, so that's, that's also some of the ways I would see, see is reaching people who otherwise wouldn't be involved with the neighborhood associations. And maybe through some of those, those kind of outreach events was, you know, um, they might pull people into the, into, into more groups. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, any uh, clarifying questions from CCEC Alders? Alder Bennett, go ahead. Hi. So um, you mentioned having disagreement at times with, um, like, people, for example, like um, people in admin, such as uh, our chancellor. I, I have to say, I can share in that experience. Um, so I'm wondering if you could clarify like how did you like navigate those situations or navigate those disagreements sure uh the way i was I, I, again i i had some excellent mentors uh early early in my uh career at the university and the one thing that i was taught is um you know before before a, a leader you know makes a decision that's that's the opportunity to present viewpoints once the decision is made you know, then, then, you know, then that's, that's when you follow, but up to the point where, where somebody, where a decision has to be made, that's when you go in there and you, you fight for what you believe in, you, you, you raise other, you raise concerns. Um, and that's, that's exactly what I did on committees. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I had others in some of these groups that saw a chance to be on a committee and interact with with you know the chancellor or other other leaders as a way to advance their own personal career. And uh, I knew going into some of these these groups that uh, that you know I was there to represent uh, in, my, in one case the academic staff, and uh, I used uh, I knew used that that position to to listen to people and fight for what I thought was best for them. It wasn't always in my own best interest. Um, and uh, that's that's where some of the uh, that's where some of the uh, you know the controversy came. But once once uh, once a decision was made, I you know I I respect that, and uh, and that's and I you know and I I I follow. But up until that point, that's that's when you uh, that's when you need to uh, voice your opinion. I think sometimes people get confused. They they like to complain after a decision is made, and it's 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 before a decision is made is where you can be the most effective. And I'm also, Thank I guess you. I was, yeah, I, 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 I try, I've, as I get older, I try to be more polite. So I, 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 I've, I've learning how to say things that sometimes are more challenging, confrontational, but I, I always try and do it in a, in a polite way. And, and, and uh, like I said, I, I, I still consider some of the people who I, I have had, you know, disagreements with, I, I, you know, I, I still get along with them, still talk with them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not personal. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, Alder Bennett, I hope that helps uh, clarify uh, that for you. Any other clarifying questions? All right. Uh, thank you all to the candidates. Um, uh, CCEC members will now take a moment to um, uh, uh, rank their choices, and uh, I will be making an announcement very shortly. So uh, bear with us for a moment. Thanks. Okay, it looks like everybody has voted. Um, 
once again, do want to let everybody know um, and encourage you if you're uh, one, thank you very much for, for participating this evening and I encourage you if you're not the picks to please, please stay involved. There's plenty of other opportunities out there with committees and obviously uh, the, the election next year. Um, our, uh, uh, pull up the results and um, I'd like to congratulate Bill. Um, uh, uh, Bill, you will be our recommendation from CCEC as uh, the alder uh, to fill the District 11 vacancy. Um, so congratulations, Bill, and thank you so much, Nick and Jesse, for participating in the process. Um, with that, um, we do have uh, our next item on the agenda related to this, which was referred to us. Um, and so I would, uh, somebody wanna make a motion? Alder Bennett, uh, seconded by Alder Conklin to appoint um, uh, Bill to the, the D11 vacancy. Um, is there any objection to me adding all of uh, the CCEC members' names as sponsors? Seeing uh, none, Alder Conklin, I assume that's not an objection. Was that a question? Um, Okay, <laughs> um, seeing none, uh, uh, well, we will have everybody's name added as sponsors. Um, and unless I see otherwise, I will assume uh, unanimous consent on, on that item. All right, fantastic. Um, so at this point, I would uh, entertain a motion. Alder Conklin, go ahead. Oh, you're, you're, um, you're muted. After two years, you think somebody would have this down pat. Um, can we hear from Bill? Does he sure. want the position? Yeah, Bill, if you... <laughs> okay, thank you. Bill, you like to speak <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I, I am I'm humbled and honored. I, I, I really appreciate giving me the opportunity uh, for this. I, I, um, I, 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 I've just, uh, I was also, I was so impressed with the other individuals. Um, you know, it's so, so, so again, thank, thank you very much. This, this means a lot to me. So. Look at that Alder Conklin, I'm catching on, on the, forgetting to unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Bill, welcome. Um, uh, we will be in touch, Alder Bennett, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I know President Furman already said this, but I just want to say this is really tough doing picky because like all of you are very well qualified. So uh, I just have to say congrats, Bill, and uh, to Jesse, Nick, and I don't know if anyone else is listening. Um, you all did great as well. It's just really tough. So thank you. Appreciate that, Alder Bennett. Thank you. And thank you again to everybody. At this point, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. All right. Uh, and then second by Alder Bennett. Um, if uh, not seeing any objection, uh, I'm going to assume unanimous consent and say good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. All right. Congrats, Bill. Good night, everybody.